Good morning. I'm so sorry. It's uh, I'm ridiculously late and um, I am very apologetic to keep you waiting without any notice at all. I The morning completely got away from me and that's not an excuse. Just uh, I'm very sorry that you had to wait so long. Um, so because I've already wasted 15 minutes of class, I want to be quick about moving forward. Uh, so today we were supposed to continue with attachment theory uh, as we had discussed on, um, when was it? Wednesday last week. Uh, <coughs> and so I guess uh, before we begin, I wanted to, I had asked one of you to bring a question with you to class today. I can't remember who it was, but uh, you had emailed a question on CP, for CP, and I, I asked you to bring it with you. Are you here, CP person? Okay, I guess that student is not here right now, but uh, I hope they do join. It was a very good question. Uh, so I wanted to just today let you know that again, I plan to not use a PowerPoint even for our online class just today. Um, and we're going to do the same thing on, um, on Wednesday. But after that, I'll ask you guys for some feedback and we'll see how well that's working for you, the lack of a PowerPoint, how well that's working for you. And then we can take it from there. Now, uh, what we've talked about so far has been sort of like, you know, we've talked about prenatal factors affecting development. We've talked about a lot of postnatal factors affecting development as well. Um, and in light of, in, with reference to development, we've talked about the development of the brain uh, specifically. And you've learned that from age zero to age three is a very sensitive and very crucial period for brain development. It's one of the most rapid, um, periods for brain development uh, in your lifespan. And the second most rapid period for brain development happens during adolescence, which we define as roughly 11 to 18, but it's usually seen as the onset of puberty um, is when adolescence is supposed to start. But the thing is that the onset of puberty varies in different um, contexts. So in particular, groups of people, the onset of puberty is as early as nine or 10 for girls and 11 or 12 for boys. And in other societies and other contexts, uh, puberty is seen to emerge a little bit later. So for girls by 11 to 12 and for boys by 12 to 13. Um, and so we kind of use puberty as our sort of um, indication for this beginning of adolescence. But um, Everything that happens in adolescence, the development that takes place when you are an adolescent, I mean, all of you are adolescents right now, um, you're what we would call older adolescents going into what is now known as emerging adulthood. So previously within um, psychology, up until the age of 18, you were referred to as an adolescent. And then beyond that, you are seen as an adult. But with the recognition that brain development does not cease at the age of 18 and continues to take place until you're about 25, 26. Um, in recognition of that, now you would be known around the age of 20, 21 as an emerging adult. So this notion of emerging adulthood um, has been introduced to account for this shift, right? To account for the fact that no, actually your brain does keep developing. And you're very much continuing to be exposed to certain influences that affect that development of your brain. So I told you last class that today we're going to talk about a particular theoretical approach to development, uh, which is more sort of focused on, um, let's say, the way that you, generally speaking, see the world, the way that you relate uh, to other people, what your sort of foundational model for all relationship formation is like. So this is a theory that set, sort of tries to explain emotional development, but also we can use it to understand maladaptive behaviors. And maladaptive, again, refers to the fact that uh, we can use this uh, particular approach to also understand what gives rise 
to um, pathology or pathological behaviors um, in human beings. This theory is very popular, it's very common. It's called the attachment theory. And um, wait, okay, the question has been asked. So let me just come to that question and then we'll, um, and then we'll go into attachment theory. So Arija's question is right here. Um, she messaged it to me. If children are strongly influenced by the environment and what they are exposed to, to what extent does exposure to the media affect the mindset of children while they are developing their ideas and beliefs? Okay, so the question is asking that what is the extent to which the media has an influence on the development of your attitudes, your beliefs, and your values? Um, given the fact that we understand children are influenced by their environment, right? So I would ask you to consider this question in light of what we've learned about Bandura social cognitive theory, that you look at what's happening around you and you think about it. And you think about, well, are these behaviors that will get me what I want? Um, and you kind of consider, well, is this something that will add value to my life in a very basic way? Uh, even as a child, you sort of, so it's like, if you see somebody behaving aggressively as a child, um, well, no, as a child, if you see someone behaving aggressively around you and you see that this person is censured for that aggressive behavior, you realize that, okay, behaving this way will not get me what I want. So this is not the way to go. However, if you see this person actually getting whatever it is that they want, um, you start to learn that aggressive behavior is the way to go if you want something, right? Because when you look at that behavior and you think about it in terms of the product or the outcome of that behavior, you are seeing that it is something that will give you what you want and hence you will adopt it, right? So remember Bandura said, you look at something, you think about it, and then you decide whether you want to adopt it or not. Second, the person modeling the behavior or whatever the behavior is, uh, or the attitude is that is being put forward has to come from somebody that means something to you, right? So it has to be a role model of some significance, at least, or some relatability. So uh, the likelihood of you seeing, let's say, something on TV as a child and then imitating it uh, is very common. You see that quite frequently, don't you? I mean, if you have little siblings um, or little cousins, you'll see them imitating particular characters that they see on TV, cartoon characters, so on and so forth. And so, yeah, absolutely. The media does have a big influence on the mindset of children while they're developing. But remember that if you account for what Piaget said, you understand that it depends on what age the child is at, right? Or even if you think through why Kotsky, it depends on what age the child is at and what are the capacities for critical and logical reasoning present in the child at that particular age. So if you were to assume, let's say your question was asking, okay, what is the impact of media on a six-year-old, right? The impact of media is that, yeah, absolutely, the six-year-old is looking at um, whatever these attitudes, beliefs are that are on whatever media that child is exposed to. But at six, the child is not thinking so abstractly about, oh, what is right and what is wrong. Consider what we studied even about moral reasoning, intellectual and moral autonomy versus heteronomy, uh, considering morality to come from an external authority instead of having accountability for it yourself, right? These are all things we know to be part and parcel of childhood. And so as that child grows older, the likelihood that he or she or they will think through what the media is saying and whether that is right or wrong or they are able to critically receive it instead of just receiving it right um, from a basic point of reasoning that that capacity is changing right so this is a, the reason i wanted to have this question put to you again is uh, because I couldn't answer it properly last class, but also um, this is a question that ties together all the different stages or the theoretical non-stage based theories, uh, sorry, that you've also studied so far, right? And so whether you consider Vygotsky, whether you consider Piaget, whether you consider Colbert, whether you consider Piaget on moral development, right? You start to think through nothing is absolute. 
when we talk about the mind because the mind is constantly receiving information and the capacity for the mind to understand or let's say how the mind understands that information to make sense of the world that is something that will change over time okay so over childhood that's a very baseline ability and as you grow older it shifts it becomes more complex and that is why for instance you are able to even ask this question that you have asked which i think 10 to maybe even 7 years ago you would not be even asking this question so my question to you would be think about why you're able to think about the things that you're thinking about right now as opposed to like 5 years ago So to answer your question, yes, the media has an influence, but then how much of that influence is, let's say, um, enduring, lasting? How much of that influence is deep-seated? All of that matters on the developmental age of the child, and also um, what happens to the child once the information has been received, right? So if you've ever seen something on TV and then asked one of your parents about it, they may have told you, no, this is not what actually happens in the real world, right? This is just TV. So it depends very much on what the adults in your life are telling you about it as well. So just something I wanted to have you hold in your mind. Uh, if there's nothing uh, from you guys, no comment or question on this, then we'll move on to attachment theory, which is what we actually needed to do today. Okay, now. i'm assuming you all know this very it's very widely depicted in media actually and also something that is broadly very very widely acknowledged and talked about so you're probably already familiar with it but when baby ducklings when ducklings are born um the first thing that they do is that they acknowledge and become attached to the duck the mother duck right If you ever seen a graphic comical representation also of ducklings you'll see that they just follow their mother around right everywhere and they kind of like do not depart from their mother and there are also a lot of really funny uh, media depictions of this process where a human being will become um the primary caregiver and get followed by ducklings everywhere they go uh this process this process of attaching to this primary caregiver is absolutely somebody said um imprinting that's exactly what it's called imprinting is something that we recognize to happen in well non human species but the basic thing about imprinting is that it is the attachment to the primary caregiver a bond with the primary caregiver so attachment theory as implied in the name itself is about that bond that you have as a child or any child has with their primary caregiver now this bond right whatever the nature of this bond is like this bond becomes the foundation for future relationships this bond becomes a baseline for or it becomes your mental model for what the world looks like and what relationships are like and whether people can be trusted or not trusted and whether people will satisfy your needs or not satisfy your needs um and so on so forth so attachment is again we have studied constantly over and over that age 0 to 3 is one of the most critical periods correct and it is age 0 to 3 that is a more sensitive time for attachment bonds as well okay obviously later on in childhood also the relationship with the primary caregiver has an impact but age 0 to age 3 um and it's really interesting because that's almost like a pre language stage right and usually when we think about relationships we think about communication we think about particular events that consist of conversations right that's the sort of informational input that we receive about our relationships we think about non verbal cues and we think about expectations and abstractions and things like that but 0 to 3 pre language pretty much right 
or let's say the baby has very limited language capacity that is the point at which that relationship has such a massive impact that lasts pretty much for most of your life right um now recognition of this relationship or the value the importance of this relationship for development um came in the 1950s with john bowlby so john bowlby did this study on what happens to orphans uh, due to what he called maternal deprivation now given it's the 1950s the gender situation is very different from what it is today so there are far less women working at that time right and because there are far less women working um and women's roles are very much uh, sort of specific to being wives and mothers right in the 50s so bolby's research focused on just the woman as a mother as the primary caregiver okay which is one flaw in his research because obviously we know that fathers can also be primary caregivers grandparents can also be primary caregivers so bolby anyway starts out and he wants to study he wants to study that being deprived of maternal care in the early years of life does that lead to children becoming more likely um to take up a life of crime okay that was his research question but it was a really valuable research question actually because he found that well you know it's true children who didn't have access to their mother in the early stage of their life earliest stage of their life 0 to 3 they were more likely to exhibit uh, let's say more anti social behavior so this is the beginning of that acknowledgement that oh you know your primary attachment has that um, makes that difference to the rest of your life and so subsequently what happens is that um i would say about 10 15 years later mary ainsworth comes along and she says well i'm going to continue bolby's research i'm going to see what happens um and so she is uh, she she has this it's called the uh, stranger uh, sorry the strange situation experiment and in the strange situation experiment um what what ainsworth did is that she has mothers and their babies in a room the mother is playing with the baby and the mother then leaves the baby alone okay so the mother leaves the room and the baby is alone in the room for a bit and then a stranger who is unknown to the baby comes into the room and uh, the baby's responses to the stranger are observed then the stranger leaves and the mother comes back and the baby's reunion behaviors are also observed okay so behavior 1 is the separation behavior when the mother leaves the room behavior 2 is stranger anxiety or how the child responds to the stranger who enters the room and finally um how the child responds when the mother returns to the room okay so she's looking at these four things when the baby is alone how does he react how does he react to the separation from the mother and then how does he react to a stranger coming into the room and then how does he react when the mother comes back into the room right so reunion so sorry separation behaviors and reunion behaviors are sort of the main things being observed when she looks at that she finds that well babies tend to respond in three particular ways okay so the and and she says that these ways these behaviors they form three different styles of attachment okay three different qualitative types of bonds that children have with their mothers three and so she says well some babies when their mother leaves they're not upset they're a little like okay where are you going but they are quick to kind of rebound uh, and and uh, sorry uh, rebound of that and then they start exploring on their own they look at all the toys they start playing on their own right so separation anxiety is is there but not much and and the child is able to manage the anxiety by comfortably exploring the environment on their own when the stranger comes in the child is like hmm okay who are you all right let's play so not very very anxious about the stranger quite comfortable when the stranger leaves and the mother comes back the baby has a very healthy response in terms of wanting to reattach to its mother you know it's uh, <clears throat> uh happy to see its mother it's smiling it responds to the mother so on and so forth that is called secure attachment yes my primary caregiver is leaving 
but it's okay because this is a safe space my primary caregiver would not put me in a compromising situation the world is a good place this is a stranger let me play with them because i think all people are inherently good i can trust the world around me i can trust people around me now my primary caregiver is back i'm so happy to see them they are all, they are you know the best caregiver i could have and so on and so forth secure attachment second type of uh, sort of response that she saw was that when the mother left there was a very high level of anxiety the baby would cry etc right high separation anxiety the stranger comes in there's also high stranger anxiety um but when the mother comes back the baby uh in reunification behavior or reunion behavior rather sorry um kind of is like rejecting her attempts at reuniting so if the mother reaches for the baby the baby ignores her or moves away and this was recognized as um avoidant attachment and then finally the last thing was that um there is still sorry there is still stranger anxiety and there's still separation anxiety but when the mother comes back into the room the baby exhibits both a uh, certain avoidant responses but also certain attaching responses right secure responses and that's called ambivalent attachment right um so these were the three key types of attachment styles that ainsworth identified but later on um she recognized so well um there is actually a fourth style and she called that disorganized attachment where <clears throat> there are elements of all three and disorganized attachment is where you are more and it's not as common as you would think by the way um but disorganized attachment is one space where you have to watch out for the development of disordered behavior or thinking later on in life because that is something where pathology can easily arise um and if you're wondering what the relationship of your earliest attachment to your primary caregiver is to the development of pathology or pathological behaviors or a psychological disorder later on in life um do you remember that i talked to you about this very sensitive case um of the 17 year old psychopath um so i'll remind you of that and and i'll remind you of the neglect that this child faced and i'll remind you that i told you from 0 to 2 he was left alone to cry okay so when we talk about attachment when we talk about that bond that relationship one of the most important factors in that relationship is trust okay um and that trust remember i also told you this is not a verbal stage necessarily right it's actually after age let's say one and a half that the child is able to say one or two words but we are saying that this starts at age 0 yeah so at this non verbal stage all that's all that's happening is that it's about the caregiver's attunement to the needs of the child by attunement we're talking about sensitivity and responsiveness okay responsiveness means the baby cries how quickly is the primary caregiver able to identify that the child needs something and sensitivity meaning how accurately is the caregiver able to fulfill these needs now there are obviously situations of deeper neglect and greater neglect um and today we actually have something called reactive attachment disorder which was diagnosed in children who face ex um, extreme trauma and extreme neglect um and I, so so that's not something i can get into detail with right now but anyway um so so think about leon and think about attachment and think about skin hunger right put it all together and that will tell you the impact that attachment your primary bonds have on how you see the world how you actually are able to connect or not connect in the case of leon with the rest of the world right um another example i would like to give you and again it's a very sensitive uh let's say it's it's a very um how do i would say right um it uh 
how do you say like when something is very um I want to say trigger warning, but I don't like saying trigger warning. I want to say it in a different way, but I guess you understand that this is sensitive and it could bring something up for you. Uh, but I'll, uh, but I, I do need to tell you about this case study. Um, so, so triggering, so this might be triggering, in which case feel free to mute me. And then, you know, when I do this, you can unmute me so that you know that it's done. If you don't want to listen, it's fine. Um, so, with uh, with sensitive with oh, the case is that uh, this psychologist, the same guy who wrote the notebooks uh, that I told uh, the the same psychiatrist who was consulting on the case that I told you about earlier, um, he was asked to come in for this four year old child who was supposed to be suffering from anorexia, okay. four years old. So he goes and he sees this child and, uh, you know, and she's on, she's being fed through a drip uh, and all the doctors uh, present are saying that, look, you know, we've looked at all elements and we've been feeding her and we've been doing this and that, but she's not gaining any weight. And she was like 30 pounds, four years old, you know, severely underweight, like life threateningly so. And so the doctor's there, the psychiatrist, and he's looking at the child and she's, she's in this situation. Um, and he sees the mother and the mother is very present and she's right next to the child. And, you know, she's talking to all the doctors and she knows what's going on. And she's the person who's actually brought this girl in, uh, her daughter into multiple hospitals to get her checked. Like she's a concerned and engaged parent, right? Um, so the psychiatrist talks to her and she says, I don't know, I feed her properly, but like, she doesn't seem to gain weight. I'm not sure what the problem is, you know, um, and they've checked her for all sorts of physiological conditions, disorders, diseases, and she doesn't have any. So they're unable to figure out, you know, okay, what is happening. And so over time through interviews, through observation, the psychiatrist, he learns a little bit about the life of the mother. What he learns is that the mother went into foster care, um, she had a, the mother herself was actually neglected quite a lot when she was little and she faced a lot of trauma, a lot of abuse. And then she was placed in the foster care system where the trauma and the abuse con continued. Um, and eventually as a result, or I guess through part of that trauma was that she was assaulted and the product of that assault was this child. Um, however, uh, the mother had experienced one positive event, which was that after all of her negative foster care experiences, she had found uh, this one home when she was an adolescent, an, uh, an older adolescent, uh, which was actually safe and actually warm and actually welcoming. And she lived there until she was 18, from when she was 12 to till she was 18. So that point of time is when she was, you know, well taken care of and she had like a safe space and she was fed well and she was taught manners and how to be in the world and how to live in the world, etc. However, the foster parents couldn't adopt her because after 18, um, if they adopted her, they couldn't be foster parents for anywhere else, which is the law in the US. Um, so they couldn't adopt her. And at 18, she was out on the street again. And it is at this point that the assault occurred and then she had this child. So the psychiatrist receives all this information, right? And he says, well, that's, that's a pretty strong history, a very traumatic history, right? So, so let me look more into this. And he notices one thing. He notices that the mother, so concerned about her child, so, um, connected in that sense, right? Knows what's happening with every single test, every single report, et cetera, et cetera. But the mother, she never picks up her daughter. She never holds her daughter. She never hugs or kisses the way that many parents you see, all parents actually mostly do it, right? They'll talk in baby talk to their babies or they'll kiss their children, hug their children, touch their children right? A gesture of warmth. So he notices that this is not happening. And what he does is that, uh, again, he's worked with so many children who have gone through trauma and abuse. So he's very well aware of like different homes and services that look out for these kids. One of these homes and services is called Big Mama's House, right? 
So he goes to her house and he says, look, I want you to come with me to the hospital and I want you to meet this mother and this child. And, uh, you know, she comes, she sees them, whatever. And when the child is discharged um, and they, again, they're taking care of the child's physical needs, right? So they're still drip feeding her and they're making sure she just survives, but she's still not gaining weight and she's still losing weight. So they're really worried. It's a life-threatening situation. So he takes the child and the mother to Big Mama's house. And, and the first thing she does is that she hugs the mother and she hugs the child. And she starts over time and she's working with the psychiatrist on this, right? And over time through this um, just simple touch, right? She'll hold, she'll hold the child, she'll hold the mother over time. What do you think happens to the child? They start getting better. They start recovering. So what had happened to that little girl, that four-year-old little girl um, was that, yes, we have established child is getting better positive recovery, you can stop now. Um, that's wrong. It's not, they don't develop an attachment. The attachment is already there. So that's incorrect. Um, Huda said they develop an attachment and get better. It's not about developing an attachment. It's learning how to attach better, okay? In the sense that, um, for the child, a particular need which was not being met is now being met. So the child needed skin to skin contact, right? Do you remember skin hunger? I taught you skin hunger. So related to, uh, related to skin hunger, something called Thrive Syndrome, where if a child doesn't receive the sort of emotional, um, if their emotional needs for care, support and feeling safe are not met, Something called Thrive Syndrome can develop where the child, child's body physiology sort of refuses to respond, refuses to survive, okay? Um, which is one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for the importance of sensitivity and responsiveness, basically of caregiver attunement to children's needs. When that doesn't happen, you see cases like Leon and this, four-year-old girl whose name I can't recall at this time, sorry. But what he sees is, the psychiatrist, what he observes is that, yes, absolutely, the child is starting to gain weight. Um, she's recovering. She's not in a life-threatening situation anymore. The child is smiling. The mother is also smiling. And he notices the mother is now making attempts to pick up her child, to have physical contact, denoting care and affection and warmth to the child. So the mother is learning a behavior. The mother is learning through her own, um, by being hugged and by being physically loved, the mother is learning how to use touch to express warmth and care. And she is now demonstrating that to her child. The child is responding to that because that was the need of the child that is not being met, had not been met. Right, skin hunger. Now it's happening. Um, and so, you know, everything is good. Now, fast forward 10, 12 years later, he goes for a follow up visit about a decade later. And uh, the child is about 12 years old, and the mother is obviously older as well. And he sees that, you know, they're both doing really well. Um, and they're both, uh, you know, happy and smiling. And you can't even tell that they had these traumatic experiences. However, because remember, he is a psychiatrist, so it's his job to look out for these things. He notices that there are periods of blankness. Okay. He notices that there are times, moments of complete disconnection from reality. Complete shutting down in both the mother and the child. So remember, developmental trauma has a very lasting effect. So this disconnection, this blankness, 
this is coming from the fact that at the end of the day from zero to four there was damage done and some of it was not reversible so you can go through the actions right and some of those actions will have an impact you know but how much impact can can you reverse developmental damage that's the question right we know that you can't reverse trauma you can you just have to deal with the effects of trauma which is what the psychiatrist did in this particular case um so coming back to attachment theory uh disorganized attachment can very well form from a situation such as the one i just described to you okay um there's a particular thing that we call it's called reactive attachment disorder that's an attachment directly related to disorganized attachment it can arise um i'll talk a little bit about how to manage trauma at the end of class uh, so hold that thought please and i will absolutely tell you a little bit more about therapy throughout the course as well um but the periods of shutting down in the mother and child are basically periods where the psychiatrist noticed that even though they were laughing or responding or talking they weren't fully mentally present in that situation the way that let's say somebody who had had a healthy developmental trajectory would be okay and i'm not saying somebody normal because i think that normal is an awful word um i don't think that normal is a good word to use when we talk about any sort of psychological condition because um well i i disagree with it so so but at the end of the day this is how he was able to identify those periods of shutting down where there's still a disconnect and if you know anything if you've ever studied anything about trauma you know that excessive trauma does lead to dissociation with somebody very rightly pointed out or disconnecting from your environment separating right so you're there you're responding but you're not actually there Have you ever had that experience after, let's say, a great? And I'm sorry, the sensitive question. Don't answer it, but it's a rhetoric, rhetorical question for you. Something to maybe think about. That, you know, if you've ever experienced a period of extreme stress or bereavement or grief, you might be in a situation where you're responding to everybody around you, and you're doing everything. You're eating your five, four meals, three meals, sorry, a day, and you're. you know taking a shower and you're doing this and doing that but you're not actually when you look back on that period of your life you don't remember anything about it you might remember flashes but you don't really know what happened you know because you weren't actually there that's what happens when we're in a traumatic situation we kind of tend to shut down so that's sort of what he was talking about bruce perry um all right so can i do you have anything from me right now that you need no okay so now that i've um no you do have something um the geese study yes okay attachment is not reversible but sorry i have a, I have a question i need to answer yeah all right so attachment is um an attachment style once it's there the belief used to be that you cannot change the way that you attach okay so attachment styles are and i'll give you the definition of attachment once again the reason that we study it in so much detail the attachment that you have is sort of like your prototype for every relationship that you will ever have okay it's your mental model for relationships that's where you know fundamentally at a human level human to human level your attachment style affects whether you trust people whether you think the world is worthy of exploration and trust and joy um if you think the world is a good place or a bad place 
are people inherently good or people inherently awful what how you think about that right are you worthy of love are you worthy of care are you worthy of support are you worthy of friendship all of those questions we answer using that primary mental model that primary attachment okay so obviously there are long term effects and the original belief was absolutely that just like imprinting attachment also cannot be changed so whatever your attachment style is that is what it will remain however we now know that you can get help for it and you can fix it so what this is called is that it's it said that you can learn right so it's called learned attachment so you relearn how to attach to people you recover from the trauma you relearn how to trust people you relearn that actually there are people who will satisfy your needs you just need to find them you relearn all of those things um but obviously this takes time and you need to get the right help for it um and it is it is absolutely something that can be done uh i i don't think it's impossible i think that i mean i have done it personally i'm not I'm afraid to share this with you. I think therapy is very, very important, um, and I think everybody, uh, if they feel like they need help, should be able to access that help. There is no shame in mental health uh, challenges, and I think understanding the role that attachment has to play is important, right? Uh, and so, yes, you can. I wouldn't say again. I don't like to use the word reverse because when you say, you know, can you reverse? uh disorganized attachment or can you reverse trauma or can you reverse this negative process two things happen one you're also kind of <clears throat> you're well firstly uh again you're falling into that trap of absolutes the human experience is too diverse to be able to be reduced to a yes or a no okay second problem is Now, when you say, "Can this be reversed?" You are discounting how much effort or how much hard work this person has put into their life to manage and work through that trauma. You're implying that their history isn't worth accounting for. But part of the human experience is that the pain, the suffering. if everybody wanted to have a happy life we would all never grow right because it's actually when you have the most discomfort that you grow the most and so this is a very adorable cat can we just can we just take a moment for this cat i think this has been a very heavy class so i would like you to i, I would like you to show this cat to everybody and also please tell us the name of this beautiful cat Don't be embarrassed. I have five cats and one dog, and I'm ha- and and that's why one of the reasons I was so late today is because of my dog. But um, yeah, please. What's his name? Her name. His his name is Zeus, and actually today is his birthday, so he's happy a year old. Happy birthday! Okay, happy birthday, yeah. Zeus. Um, very cute. He's beautiful. Uh, so thank you for that light comedic relief from this very intense uh lecture. So so anyway. so i think that it's important to account for attachment absolutely and uh, there are people who will say that it's not as important my perspective from a research point of view is different and i always emphasize attachment a lot oh it's zeus not zeus i said his name wrong sorry i'm sorry okay um so coming back to or rather wrapping up attachment theory uh key takeaways key takeaways remember i told you bull be only focused on the mother as the primary caregiver because of the situation or the sort of societal context that his research was in so yes um later on shafer was a researcher who added that no actually it doesn't matter whether it's the mother or the father or the grandparent because it is not necessary that the mother is the primary caregiver for a child a grandparent or a um a father can also be the primary caregiver okay 
so attachment that primary attachment does not have to necessarily be with the mother it can be with anybody else who is the primary caregiver primary caregiver is defined as the person who is primarily responsible for satisfying all the needs of the child at that stage of life all right now while Schaefer was introducing this notion, and between the time that Bowlby introduced his theory, uh, this uh, other experiment was done, which will also sort of solidify everything you guys have learned so far. And it was um, it's a very popular experiment that I'm sure you've heard about. It was conducted by this gentleman named Harlow. And he had a clock mother, and he had a wire mother, and he had baby Reese's monkey. Have you heard about this experiment? No? Okay. So in this, okay, so I want, all right, cool. So why don't, if, if you've heard about this experiment, why don't you tell me about it? Because it's related to skin hunger, it's related to the touch story that I just told you. Huzefa, go ahead. Okay, so it's me, a bandar hota hai, matlab, hai, uh, jo ke, in, uh, newborn hota hai. और उसमें एक एक वाइड मदर होती है ठीक है जिसके पास फीडर होता है और एक क्लॉथ होती है मतलब जो ऐसे कह सकते हैं ज्यादा कंफर्ट वाली होती है तो फिर वो मतलब लेकिन जो मंकी है वो मतलब फीड करने के लिए उसके पास जाता है लेकिन अक्सर जो है वो दूसरे के पास रहता है जो कंफर्ट वाली होती है जो जिसको और जब उसको कोई डराता है कोई इस तरह करता है तो वो फौरन क्लॉथ वाली मदर के पास जाता है ना कि फीडर वाली Yeah, that's correct. So there are two. There's a wire mother who has a feeding bottle and there's a cloth mother, okay? Uh, and by mother, it's like basically wire structures. One is wrapped in soft fabric and one is not, okay? And one is just a bottle, but they're both meant to serve as models of two types of primary caregivers, okay? And the researchers noticed, and their perspective was, their perspective was, that the baby monkeys will bond with the wire mother over the cloth mother because that is where their sustenance is coming from, right? This is their source of survival, so this is where they're going to go. But that's not what actually happened. And the very fact that that's not what actually happened tells us that there is more to simply feeding a child, even at that age zero. The child needs more from their primary caregiver. They need touch and warmth and support, physical um, bonding, right? So again, think through skin hunger, et cetera, et cetera. So Harry Harlow's experiment, uh, I think it was Harry Harlow. I could be making that up. I just remember last names now at this point, but Harlow's experiment teaches us that there's more to being a primary caregiver than simply making sure that a baby is fed. Okay. Babies need more from us as primary caregivers. That's the lesson. Um, and, and okay, just a couple of things in the chat box. So absence of either parent can't be filled by the other. That is very true, very valid. Um, relationships with, you see, you can't treat your relationship with your parents actually. So you, the way that I think about it based on everything I've studied is, you have absolutely a relationship with your parents together, right? And then you have a relationship with your parents as individuals. And we also have to account for the fact that family situations are varied and diverse. Okay, there are blended families and there are single parent families and there are, you know, um, families where there are no parents as well. And, in all of those situations, what is, I think, on a personal level, <clears throat> the way that I look at, well, I guess, the way that I look at human, human beings is that we are so, and I keep saying this to you, right, and I might sound like a broken record, and I'm sorry about that, but again, the human experience is so diverse, everybody's experience of the environment is so unique, um, and there are particular things that I don't think we choose, okay? So I don't, I mean, some things just happen to us and some things we make happen. And I think I'm 
possibly completely losing you right now but i guess let me bottom line it for you um what my bottom line is that every family situation in terms of composition is different and diverse and as children your experience of your parents is not it doesn't happen in a vacuum okay the older you get the more you recognize and realize that your parents are also at the end of the day people with their own flaws right with their own set of issues with their own challenges but when you're little you don't know any of those things right remember right early in the class we were talking about how the way you receive the world depends also on what your capacity to logically think about the world is and so your relationship with your parents um doesn't happen it's not a it's not i would say that that's something that shifts and changes over time but the individual relationship with either or each of your parents that's something that will really have an impact on you but again like the relationship between both your parents also matters it matters whether both your parents are in the picture only one of them is in the picture or if both your parents are in the picture what is their relationship like all of these things have an impact on you and they also have an impact on how you see yourself and the world around you having potential for trusting relationships okay and i'm using the word parent here very loosely i'm i'm talking about your primary caregivers because at the end of the day if a parent is not in the picture for donkey's ear um the absence of the parent has had an impact on, on the child but the parent has not had an impact on the child because the parent has just not been involved right so there's so many different nuances you have to think about which is why i always tell you guys that when you're asking a question ask yourself does this require a yes or no absolute answer because in psychology these absolutist notions are are inappropriate because the human condition is one of diversity and change and shifting right so we identify patterns but we can't set things in stone right so if something bad happened to you um you may think that you will never recover from it you may think that it never happened to you you may think that it don't happen to you because you are bad which is not the best way to think so please don't think about that um or if you are thinking about it that's not you know you need to find help somewhere because we are all worthy and we're all good um so summing it up i suppose uh as you can tell i'm very passionate about attachment uh primarily because i <clears throat> spent a large part of my career working with young people who have suffered greatly because of disrupted attachments um and so this matters to me greatly but anyway um <clears throat> secure attachment is absolutely the healthiest look i'm not going to say ideal ideal is wrong word secure attachment is the healthiest way to attach okay um i have a question for you i have a question for you piaget talks about object permanence the ability to know that something is still around even if it's not in your line of vision pj talks about object permanence what's the relationship of object permanence to attachment is there one can you find one are are they somehow connected sara Um, and me yourself yeah go ahead so it can be the case for when one parent is not around or out of the picture or even for like a small gap of time um where for example if you are in university in a different city uh, and your parents are at home you still know that they are around and there's this attachment even if they're not in front of you there's this bond and if they're absent or out of the picture then 
you wonder what, about that bond and it has an effect on you. Yeah, 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 good. So, um, yeah, it's exactly what you said. Uh, just knowing that this person is still around enables you to have that relationship with them. Okay, uh, Naval, then Umema, and then, I don't know, somebody else had raised their hand, but they lowered it. So, Naval, go ahead. I also feel like when uh, grow, like doing like growing up, if a parent is not around and there's a, like an extended period of absence, I feel like the way it translates to adult relationships and friendships, we, I think that individuals will start believing that there's not going to be a long-term relationship um, with an other individual in their life. So they'll probably start um, uh, either they'll stop trusting people to stay in their lives for an extended period of time and maintain the friendship or relationship they never had growing up, or they will, as a coping mechanism, try to push people away. So before they get left, they're the ones going to be who are going to leave in the first place. Yeah. So it can express itself, like you said, in commitment issues, not being able to commit to a relationship or on the flip side, overcommitting and overcompensating for fear of being abandoned or left, right? So in both, in both situations, uh, not committing or overcommitting, in both of those situations, the fear or the underlying belief actually is that you are not worthy of being loved. And that, that sense of not being worthy stems from feelings of neglect during that most vulnerable and most sensitive early childhood time. All right. Um, also, the, so, uh, so Umema, go ahead, and then I'm going to look at the chat. OK, so uh, I was also going to make the point that uh, Nawal made. But uh, on the other hand, I believe that uh, it doesn't always have to be that uh, concept that, you know, object permanence refers to the uh, out of sight, out of mind. And then like, uh, I don't know how to explain this. Maybe I, I could be wrong, but I could give my own example. For, exa uh, for example, in my childhood, I had a very, very strong bond with my father. But uh, as time progressed, um, I don't know, because of my age, since I'm a female and, you know, we grew distant. So at this point, I mean, we don't talk much. We don't... Uh, uh, we don't have much conversations so like can it be related to I mean I know sometimes I get irritated that that okay why don't we talk much and why do, doesn't he share things with me why don't I why don't we share the same bond but then my mother she says me you guys still have the attachment that you had but it's just that some things have changed just because of you know the age and how like my age and because I'm a female so would that be uh, like a relationship between object permanence and attachment theory. How is that relationship? Like, you know, he's there and you know, he's mm -hmm. still there and you know, he still loves you. Just mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. interactions are smaller, maybe shorter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we really don't interact much. Like uh, he he's on his, uh, I mean, you know, he... It's a, that, that's how it is. But you still know that if you need him, he's there for you, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's kind of related. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Amna, I'm going to ask you to hold on for a second, uh, please. So just keep your hand raised. I'm going to quickly just go through so many messages. <laughs> wow. You guys text fast. Um, how do babies react in disordered attachment? In disordered attachment style, children were likely to display elements of secure attachment, avoidant attachment together, okay? But it's different from ambivalent attachment because it doesn't follow a pattern. It doesn't follow a pattern. So the reunion behavior is what we use to define whether an attachment is secure or disorganized, sorry, or ambivalent or avoidant. But in disorganized attachment, the reunion behavior was so wildly different every time the child met the mother after being separated um, that we couldn't, or rather not be, the researchers weren't able to say that this is how they react. But what I can tell you is that they react in ways that have elements of all three of those styles when they are reunited with their mothers. 
anxious attachment is not actually i would see it as not well it's not a thing because at the end of the day it's anxious attachment is what you can associate with avoidant attachment okay but all attachment has a level of anxiety which is separation anxiety from the primary caregiver which is why i would say that we can't really say that you know avoidant attachment is anxious of attachment because actually ambivalent attachment is also anxious attachment it's also coming from place of high separation anxiety high stranger anxiety right so so that would be my response so it's related it's not completely different at all but i would say that the terminologies are split um i don't know what this is and you can never overcome your attachment style i already mentioned you can learn to have healthy attachments um not sure what this is if the attachment is evolved we are still aware of what it used to be yes absolutely um it can be relevant when the mother leaves for any instant separate from your parent there's permanence that stems from your attachment with parent. yeah you still know that your parent is around even if you can't see them um people isolate themselves from relationships people blame everything on themselves that's called having an internal um sorry having an external locus of control um well actually no yeah yeah and then this may be a, sorry okay so it's a question i'm just going to say it uh it it's a direct to me um this may be a question some people wouldn't be very comfortable with but do homosexual parents children show a different type of attachment as to those with opposite sex parents um no because at the end of the day i talked about the primary caregiver and harlow's experiment also further proves that it's not about having a a um um a mother that breastfeeds you right it's about providing both nourishment and love and warmth and touch and skin and that can be given by a father or a mother so it can be given by two mothers and it can be given by two fathers i don't see why it would be a different type of attachment i do feel though that children with homosexual parents are likely to face a um, a great deal more trauma in terms of bullying from intolerant peers and their intolerant parents uh that's what i would say uh can children forget their mothers if they are around shortly after their birth and then shortly afterwards they aren't around will there always be an instinct in the child that will pull them toward their mother um so adoption shows us that at the end of the day um the biological bond yes is there and yes it's important and yes it means something to every child but adoptive parents and the quality of that parenting and the very fact that an adopted parent um an adopt adoptive child adopted child sorry um the way that they are raised that bond absolutely subs for whatever the biological bond could have been because again remember it's about the love it's about the care and the sustenance right so i would say that yeah it can but but at the end of the day again no absolutes right so think about the age at which the child was adopted what were the situations that the child had gone through up until the point that they got adopted or <clears throat> in surrogacy it's different because in surrogacy at age 0 the child goes to their parents right and so that's a different example so when we so two different cases um <coughs> okay uh it's 9:49 so you have anything else you need from me okay Now I'll see you guys in person on Wednesday whoever can show up if you have any feedback on our in person class last Wednesday if you missed the presentation if you want me to use it let me know um I'll I'll maybe send you an opinion poll of some kind maybe because I I really prefer teaching without a visual aid or uh, it just it's, it's more fun for me but it depends on you so we'll find out how you feel about that um let me know if you have any thoughts other than that bye bye
and uh, see you in person or online, whatever you prefer on Wednesday. Also, again, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I'm sorry, I feel really bad about it. Sorry. Bye-bye.